Hello there, this is just another student of law. I am your host Cameron Hayden and this or today's episode is part of the public law series. The question we're going to be discussing is our constitution is dominated by the sovereignty of parliament but parliament's sovereignty is no longer if ever was absolute. It is no longer right to say Parliament's freedom to legislate in the midst of no qualification, whatever. Step by step, gradually but surely, the English principle of absolute legislative sovereignty of Parliament, which I see derived from Coke and Blackstone, is being qualified. And we're just going to explain this and whether that's still the case. Now this question is a really important one because with Brexit underway, uh, by the way, to carbon date this, this is uh, going out in 2017 in August. So we already had one of the Great Reformation cases or uh, Great Reformation Acts going on. So this is really quite important to the now, even though stuff like the Grenfell Fire appears to be taking modern headlines. So we are talking about this quote that came from Lord Hope of Craig's head, the now former Supreme Court head, because, you know, in this time period that you're listening, Lady, uh, or Baroness Hale, rather, of Gray's Inn has now become Supreme Court judge, and we are dealing with the serious issue that all of the Supreme Court judges are due to retire in a few years' time, which means there could be an entire reshuffle of the highest end of our Supreme Court. So that could mean more females, more uh, gentlemen of an Afro-Caribbean descent, as well as more gender and more uh, religious diversity. But that is for another time to discuss. Right now we're talking about this question of parliamentary sovereignty. Now, there's a few sort of words that need to be qualified even in this quotation for us to get a backing. What do we mean by our constitution? Well, Britain is one of perhaps three countries in the world that has an unwritten or uncodified constitution. What do we mean by a codified constitution? We look at the Napoleonic codes that are the backbone of the French, German, just about every European country, and the codified constitution of america the declaration of independence if you will those sort of articles are codified constitutions they are constitutions that exist in one location now as andrew lesueur the bricks court barrister and lecturer at my home university the university of essex had to say on the matter Britain's unwritten constitution is essentially a constitution that exists in many places. What we mean by this is if you want to know what the constitution of the United Kingdom is, or at least England and Wales, which is the jurisdiction, you're going to have to look at more than just one document. So no looking at the independence constitution of America. This is more... You want to learn about murder? Go look at Lord Coke's Institute. You want to know about the Scot Scotland separation and all that? You want to look at the Delegated Acts, Delegation Acts of 1990. You get the idea, 1999. You get the idea. You have to shop around with the British Constitution to find a way. It exists in case law, statute, and just other prerogative powers that have travelled down over the centuries. What do we mean by sovereignty? Well, if we're looking at a Oxford Dictionary explanation, sovereignty is just, you know, power really, it's absolute power. It's a sovereign in the sense of the monarch, usually. And monarchs tend to have absolute power. But we're using it in this sense to merely say the person at the top of the chain. What is Parliament? Well, that's another question that's really transitioned over the time and over periods. You know, Parliament in the day of Lord Coke was very different to what Parliament is in the time of Lord Blackstone and even Dicey and even 
Lord Hope today. But suffice to say, in the time of Lord Hope, Parliament, we can say, is the House of Commons primarily. Okay, so we've got that cleared up. Now, on the question of parliamentary sovereignty and this principle, this is where the real meat of confusion comes in. So, parliamentary sovereignty and this freedom to legislate without qualification. Uh, before we get on there, qualification, just so you know, is basically the idea of checks and balances. You know, do... Is there something that is required of Parliament before it makes a decision? Or can it just go ahead and do whatever it likes? Uh, Dicey, when he was writing in the late 1800s, early 1920s, he sort of wrote about the idea that Parliament could go ahead and within reason do anything it wanted. You could go into France and start legislating there and just say, you know what? French can't walk around the streets of Paris. And Parliament was supreme enough that that could be done. Whether it could be enforced, different question. But it seemingly had the power to do that. But to understand this principle, really we need to understand its growth from where it came from. So Lord Dicey, ah, Professor Dicey, you're going to notice me making a mistake a few times throughout this, but Professor Dicey gives us an idea. He says, or at least Lord Hope in this case, he says, look to Lord Coke and Lord Blackstone. So let's go all the way back to the time of Lord Coke. This is the real beginning of the Enlightenment period in Great Britain. A real time for change. And this is the period when we saw the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Lord Coke was around uh, late 1500s, mid 1600s, and was quite an authority for his time. And as we will let it get on to, the reason why Blackstone and Lord Coke differ in some regards. But anyway, so Lord Coke, at the time of his writing, made the statement the power of the power and jurisdiction of Parliament for making laws when preceded by Bill is tro so transcendent and absolute it cannot be confined for causes or persons within any bounds. This was written in the Institutes. I'm going to say the fourth volume, although none of the Institutes have a volume name, and that goes more back to how Lord Coke preferred that you understood the principles of law rather than referencing them. Which is sad we never took that on in the future ages, because then I would have a lot less reading to do. But, you know, problems of the past. Sir Francis Bacon, his rival at the time, and we're going to try and get into this very quickly, very briefly here. Lord Coke in general was a guy who believed that Parliament, while being sovereign, shouldn't be sovereign in everything. And that it was the role of the judiciary and the people, to some extent, to step up if Parliament, which in this case was the monarchy, was overstepping its bounds. You know, he believed in the idea of fundamental rights, which is something he's talked about in the case of Dr. Bonham, which came out in 1610. So this is really early on in Lord Coke's philosophy that he was even talking about the idea of fundamental rights. Anyway, his statement that, you know, Parliament had could do anything to any cause or person within any bounds is something that Sir Francis Bacon, his rival at the time, who believed differently. Uh, Sir Francis Bacon didn't believe in fundamental rights. He believed in natural law. Uh, we're getting into jurisprudence a little here, but natural law is the idea that God has chosen people on this earth who know instinctively what is the law, you know, this is handed down by God. Sir Francis Bacon believed that the monarchy, who Lord Coke is framing as Parliament, had this power, and he's the one who actually says Parliament is a supreme and absolute power. And he says this in the cases of Aziz, of Bronlau, 
and Mitchell, as well as the case of Bates. Uh, these are both, I believe, fictional cases. I might be wrong in that statement. Please don't hang me on that. But you'll find the discussion about this anyway in his work, the argument in the case De Regi Consolto 1616, part of the works of Francis Bacon. So we have already this view starting to come together that Parliament's sovereignty, which at the time of monarchy, is an absolute supreme power insofar as Parliament is the ultimate court in the land. Lord Coke is maybe making a suggestion here that if there came to be a thing such as perhaps a Supreme Court or a higher sanction of law, then Parliament would no longer be supreme. But we're jumping to conclusions here. Lord Coke hasn't quite reached that stage. And he's a man who becomes important during the American Revolution. But we'll get to that later today. So the next concept of Parliament sovereignty that really gets the boat rocked a little comes with Montesquieu. Now, almost everyone who does law, or at least does politics, will have heard of Montesquieu's The Separation of Powers which comes from his work, The Spirits of the Law, which is, uh, I believe, 18th century. It's 18th century. Anyway, and later editions. Um, Montesquieu said there exists a separation of power in Britain, the separation between the legislative branch, the executive branch, and the judicial branch, and this separation of power ensures good governance. But what we can also take this to mean is Parliament is not sovereign. Parliament is kept in check by the other branches. Parliament, in fact, is split into three to an extent here. We're saying that Parliament is the legislative branch, the executive branch is the House of Lords, and the monarch, the monarch who at the time basically picks the lords. You know, that's why we hear sayings like lords and lackeys you know where they've the lord has picked the queen or the king at the time picked whoever they wanted to fill the lord's chambers so that they could get their own support going but basically what this comes down to is we have each branch keeping each other in check and the idea that if one goes over their powers the other two would stop them And that they had the power to do that. That's kind of like a British concept in general towards Europe and the idea of the European principle that you never let anyone get too powerful. So that's that's an old concept and that really comes into our ideas. But it does run against the concept of parliamentary sovereignty that Dicey later puts forward. Anyway, a few years on from that, maybe a couple of... A couple of decades on, we have Lord Blackstone. Now, a little bit of context, Lord Blackstone is also considered one of our big authorities on law. I think you're quite common with the knowledge of Blackstone Chambers being one of the top chambers in Britain, and the Blackstone uh, statute books. What you may be less aware of is the original commentaries, or Blackstone's commentaries on the law of England, which came out back when he was around, which was a few decades after uh, the passing of Lord Coke Lord, and Sir Francis. Anyway, so Blackstone was also, interestingly, around more or less the times of the American Wars of Independence. Now... Lord Blackstone was an advocate of the US colonies, staying colonies, and he voted in Parliament and publicly said on a number of occasions that that should be the case. I'm, what I'm trying to get to here is his statement that Parliament is sovereign may be to some extent politically influenced. Now, I know that's a question we don't want to talk about when it comes to judges. We don't like to say that judges are lawmakers or that judges seemingly have inbuilt biases. But this was a different time and certainly the judiciary did not exist in the same way. They didn't hide from who they are. 
I mean, Lord Coke, it's well known that after he was thrown out, you could say, from his positions as a judge, because of how much he advocated this idea of fundamental rights, he actually became an MP. He became a politician. Very similar, almost a reverse of Lord Reed, in that Lord Reed was a politician turned judge. This was the other way around. Lord Blackstone was in a dual position. He was both in the House of Lords, and so essentially part of Parliament, and a senior law lord, and so in the judicial branch, uh, bye-bye separation of powers. Anyway, Lord Blackstone made the statement quite clear that Parliament reigns supreme, and in fact, Parliament has the ability to, ability to do Everything, this is a quote here, do everything that is not naturally impossible, thus making Parliament omnipotent. Okay, so we really hear Lord Blackstone here going a step further than Lord Coke. Lord Coke just said they were qualified within reason to do anything they wanted, uh, but he obviously had restrictions. Lord Blackstone doesn't even drop the hat there, he just says, no, nope, they're omnipotent. They can do everything as long as it's not impossible. Uh, this is a view which is, at the time, supported in the writings of Geoffrey Goldsworth uh, in his work, The Sovereignty of Parliament, History and Philosophy. That's a modern work, by the way, and his other work, The Myth of the Common Law Constitution, by the way, all references, I'm going to try and put them in at the end. Right? So, in Jeffrey's works, he sort of supports the idea that Blackstone was saying at the time. However, one of the founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, who was well known for writing, I mean, they're, they're all pretty well known for writing. Thomas Jefferson, he wrote at that time that he did not believe that was the case in Britain. Got to remember, the US colonies were under British rule, and so they were part of Britain, so... Anything they were really saying, you can consider as part of the debate on parliamentary sovereignty. So Thomas Jefferson, after independence, was writing in his works, the writings of Thomas Jefferson being his autobiography, correspondence, reports, messages, addresses, and other writings, official and private. Uh, this was released in Washington. In those writings, Thomas Jefferson really goes into detail that he believed that the American independence was justified because Parliament is not sovereign and there are fundamental rights. Something to know, the American jurisdiction has always taken a lot from Lord Coke's works and some of Lord Blackstone's earlier works, they didn't really agree with his whole statement so they couldn't uh, outlaw the stamp tax and whatnot. You know, but... Another time, another time. Anyway, so Lord Blackstone did make those statements. There were philosophies at the time that didn't even believe Parliament was that sovereign. Dicey, I want to really drive this point home. Dicey did not look at all the facts. I'm sorry to say this. This does seem like a very biased decision. But if you look at the, f the information, Lord Coke was a bit of a conflicted man in his writings. But generally speaking... The Americans probably had it right on Lord Coke. He wasn't someone who believed in Parliament's sovereignty. He was someone that believed Parliament was sovereign, but that in a lot of cases, Parliament should be prevented from being sovereign. So Lord Coke didn't believe in the idea of absolute sovereignty. That's something that Sir Francis Bacon suggests Lord Coke believes based on his words. And Dicey takes that idea. In fact, when he makes his statements in his works... Dicey points at Lord Coke's writings. I went back and read the same writings that Dicey was referring to and found no mention of what he was saying. So I always find this is a very annoying thing. Like Lord Coke, for example, has been criticised by later academics who said there was no legal authority for some of the things he's saying. Some of the stuff he said was really out there and there was no cases to back it. And in fact, Lord Coke picked and chose the law he wanted to reference to. I mean, Lord Blackstone is the exact same. He picked the sort of stuff that supported his view and neglected the other things. Maybe that's our idea of precedent, you know, but it was a very different time. 
And Dicey uses the fact that it was a long time ago to just pick and choose his areas. So when Dicey writes about parliamentary sovereignty, he could use these certain contexts from Lord Coke and Blackstone. He could use the idea that Blackstone was saying Parliament is omnipotent and that Coke was, according to Sir Francis Bacon, saying that Parliament had absolute power. With that being said, round about the time of Dicey's, one of his later cases, we also had the case of Macaulay and the King, 1920. Now, in this case, Lord Chancellor Birkenhead declared Parliament had an uncontrolled power. Now, at this point in time, we could say separation of powers got out the window. Dicey exists at this point in a time when Britain has just won, if you can say it was a victory, World War I. The empire is at its peak. Probably Britain is the most powerful country in the Western Hemisphere and the world. The navy that does not bow. They've beaten Napoleon. They've beaten the Germans. They've, they say they basically gave up on the Americans. So we're, we're going to say they're at a point in time when they cannot be challenged. So perhaps when Dicey says... Parliament held the right to make or unmake any law whatever, and further that no person or body can override or set aside the legislation of Parliament. He was talking about a government in a position of power, in a very strong position of power. And, you know, we, we can make reference to a lot of this stuff by looking at um, John Ferris, his work, The Greatest Power on Earth, which... Great Power on Earth, Great Britain, 1920s, which is basically saying in the early part of the 1920s, Great Britain was a global powerhouse. We're not talking about the Depression period just yet, which was the late 20s, but when Lord, when Professor Dicey was making his statements and writing about Parliament sovereignty, it was a time when Britain was a lot better. They had also just introduced the Parliamentary Acts of 1911, which had curtailed the House of Lords' powers. So... When we are talking about this, the Parliament of the day is very different from the Parliament of Lord Coke or even Lord Blackstone. This is a Parliament where the House of Commons is steadily gaining this absolute omnipotent power that it once had to share. So, we move into the time period from Dicey to Lord Hope. Now, we know already the Great Depression kind of brought humility to this once great nation but a lot more than that happened we had world war ii and that really destroyed parliament sovereignty but we must keep moving forward in the years that came from dicey to hope it's fair to say the legal landscape had changed drastically the Jackson case came in 2005, yet long before it, Dicey's claims to parliament sovereignty were under contestion. Not just at the time by his peers like Muck Ilwain. So even at the time, you know, Lord Hope is looking back saying, oh yeah, Dicey was saying parliament sovereignty. But remember, he also said, if ever it was. And that's because some legal authorities like Ilwain were saying it's not. Uh, Muck Ilwain in the High Court of Parliament and its Supremacy, a historical essay on the boundaries between legislation and adjudication in England, 1910. So this, is, this came out probably um, in the latter half of Dicey's works, because remember, he kept republishing his essays every now and again as he added to it. Anyway, Ilwain believes that it, you know, this was not not the case, that historically Parliament has not been supreme, and he brought up some of the arguments I'm saying in that Dicey picked and chose the judicial decisions that support his view. In fact, almost blindly ignored the amount of information coming from Lord Coke's works. However, for some reason, Dicey's not really challenged on this point until we get to 1955, when H.W.R. Wade in the basics of legal sovereignty, 
again challenges this theory um but before that people like wade supported dicey's theory so it's 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 a very difficult time period to discuss but we could say for at least 30 years no everyone seemed to believe parliament was still sovereign this begins to make a change in the Lou case 1963 so this is a european case that you will have encountered in eu law called the case case 26 slash 62 van gend and Luz, 1963 now in this case they talk about the new legal concepts of direct effect and they state that EC, the EEC, the European Economic Community, constitutes a new international law where statutes have limited their sovereign rights in certain fields. This is further gone over in the Costa case, where or the Costa case, also known as Case 664, Flamenco Costa and Enel 1964. So it's a four, one year after. Where they talk about the real powers stemming from a limitation of sovereignty or a transfer of powers of the national states. And they derive this from Articles 267 of the Treaty of the European Union, where it says that regulation shall be binding and directly applicable to all states. And the same in Article 4 3, where it says law stemming from treaty cannot be overridden by domestic legal provisions. Something that it then supports in the case of Handel, which is, you know, case 1170, International Handel, Skoffskon, sorry over MBH, Einther und Fasten für Gietre und Fatenmittel. That's like case 1970. But what we're basically getting from this, and even the cases of uh, Simenfol which is case 106.77, Amministrane del Finene de Leo Stato Simenfal, Spa, 1978. What we're basically getting in this large, like, bang of European law, uh, I say large bang, it was like 30 years, but this tide of EU law basically said Parliament parliaments are no longer supreme that the supremacy of parliament has passed to the european jurisdiction and when they say in some fields it's even when you talk about some fields that means all fields well at least it came to be basically all fields but that's that's a later point of discussion but what we've got to focus here is over the waters in Europe, the idea of a parliamentary sovereignty was being challenged. In the UK, we still had parliamentary sovereignty. Nothing had changed. However, it's when we start to talk about Britain's transition to join the ECC and later the European Union in this 1970s period that we really see this Dicean concept of parliamentary sovereignty give over to a Lord Coke and Lord Blackstone interpretation. I have not really spoken a lot about Lord Blackstone's view on international law. One of the interesting facts is Blackstone basically says you don't have to follow international law, but you could still be sovereign and give powers to international laws as long as you're the person who agrees to them, which is really a silly way of covering up the fact that you've given over sovereignty. But, lo and behold, anyway, so Lord Kilmer, who was the Lord Chancellor in Edward Heath's government at the time of the transitional period when they joined the European Union, actually advised the Lord Chancellor and said, uh, joining ascension to the EEC will mean requiring Parliament to make some sacrifice of sovereignty. And the later Lord Gardiner, who then became Lord Chancellor, did said this wasn't really the case, you know. If you create legislation to join, you can also leave. They talked about that in the House of Lords Hansard in 1967. 
the statement by Lord Kilmer, by the way, is on the public records office. Uh, there's a storage of it, FO371150369. Anyway, the idea was Lord Garner was saying, if you can create it, you can revoke it, so the power doesn't go anywhere. Lord Kilmer was saying, you've created it, it's wildfire, until they say you can take it back, you can't. And so many believed ultimate sovereignty of parliament was not abridged. Very confusing way of going about it, but we can say European law shook, shook the boat of British parliament. Now, despite the inconsistency of discussion on this matter, the debate evolved in the case of Blackburn, which is Blackburn and Attorney General 1971. In this case, it was put forward that the result of the European Communities Act 1972 would be that the sovereignty of these lands, these lands being the UK, will be henceforth limited. And on the matter of whether Parliament could revoke limitation, Lord Denning himself remarked, if they were to withdraw, the court will decide whether it is legally possible or not. Well, isn't that interesting? Lord Denning was saying that in the 70s. And did that not come true in our age in 2017 in the Brexit case? Maybe more on that later. Anyway, what they were trying to say, what even you could take from that is if the court is deciding whether Parliament can make the decision on Brexit, then Parliament's not sovereign anyway. Because that's the qualification right there. They have to, court has to agree to it. So we already have one sort of the Supreme Court emerging. If we have the supremacy of European law, then again, Parliament's not supreme. Because they have to rely, they cannot go against European law. They have to agree to it. Or say they're not agreeing to it. But they've got to basically qualify themselves in the eyes of European law. Now, What's important to draw attention to is the fact that Dicey did believe it was possible for Parliament to secede its sovereignty if it transferred its overall sovereignty. So giving over a couple of pieces of the crown jewels doesn't mean you've given up the crown. But Dicey saying if you give up the crown, you secede its sovereignty. What's interesting, though, is it was this view is sort of ignored by a lot of people who just go back to Blackstone when he said law of nations here adopted is in its full extent by the common law and it's held to be part of the law of the land. So Blackstone basically said, OK, if we have legislation from the European Union and we enact it in Parliament, then it's not European law, it's Parliament law, Parliament Supreme. And that's the Monis view. Uh, Monis view is again discussed by Le Soeur in his public law textbook under the and again it was also discussed by the House of Laws as a constitutional court implications of ex parte uh, European EOC but anyway this this sort of idea that parliament sovereignty always exists and we've never given it over unless Parliament explicitly says so, is, is a really interesting point. But it doesn't really help us as we're getting closer, because we've already established quite early on here that Parliament, parliamentary sovereignty is a very confusing area. There's more evidence than not that points to the idea that Parliament is not sovereign. Although for some reason, this mythical belief that Parliament is sovereign has run rampant in the law legal test books for a very long time that in the most recent few decades that's really been massively eroded and that parliament really isn't sovereign honestly so we get now to the cases of gaz and folks um this is another european case came out in 1974 Application Disgaz SA S A and Folks Veritas Limited, uh, 1974. This was community law case. So this again, 
precedes us joining the European Union. But remember, when you join the European Union, all past law automatically becomes your law and has to be followed. In this community law, it was, which was enacted by Parliament, it was decided this would sit equally besides any Parliament statute. And that's what H.P. Bulmer Limited and Bollinger SA, 1974, said. So this was even, we've got UK, we've got another European case law here basically stating that community law is on the same footing as government law. And earlier articles say that it goes beyond government law. So essentially... The European Union is equal to Parliament, and if you have something that's equal to a body, it means that the original body is no longer supreme, because supremacy is the idea of one, not two. Anyway, that led to the idea of a dualist system, which some legal authorities like P.B. Keenan in his writing, Some Legal Consequences of Britain's Entry into the European Common Market, which was released in 1962, so it's, again, before we even join, he was sort of saying, if we join, we're, we're still sovereign. It's just just split sovereignty. So there's there's still sovereignty there. And while we can take the veneer, it's one of those strange things that, on the face of it, we always have to go around and say, yeah, Britain's supreme. Yeah, parliamentary sovereignty is a thing. Nationalism, yeah. But in the reality of things, it's very much not that case. Anyway, so Blackstone, Lord Delling, in the case of Felix Stone, they considered the conflict between Article 86 and an actual Act of Parliament. So, there we go. Uh, this was a case that Lord Denning was actually in and was talking on. And you've got to keep in mind, okay, before we go any further, Denning did really reverse his mindset in later cases. Maybe because he didn't entirely understand European law at this point in time. But Lord Denning at the time had to decide whether they should follow a European article or whether they should follow a parliamentary act and majority of the court fell in favour of following the parliamentary act and this was what they said was the reason behind this is what Lord Denning said was the reason behind it once the bill is passed by parliament these courts will have will then have to abide by the statute without regard to treaty at all now we've already referenced European case law earlier that basically said no 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 that is not the case. Anyway, what's important is Lord Denning indeed learns from this. It's The thing is, Lord Denning is only really following the views of Lord Diplock, who earlier suggested that notwithstanding any conflicts, the courts will give effect to an Act of Parliament over a treaty provision. And keep in mind, Lord Diplock was more or less on the same level as Lord Denning at this time, if not a bit more senior. And so Lord Denning was just really following suit with the, the, the bigger picture. He changes his mind, though, in deciding the case of Shields. Uh, Shields is Shield versus Combi's Holding Limited, 1978. So a few years on, four years on from the previous case. Oh, yeah, a few years on. By the way, Lord Diplock, uh, the Felix Stone case <coughs> is... Following on from a article four years earlier that would have been released at the time that we joined the European Union the first time around in 1972. And that article was the common market and the common law. And it basically was describing the relationship between English law and European common law. And in effect, saying Parliament was more supreme. That was in 72. Though. And Denny made a choice in 76. And this new case in 78 would have been during the time of the referendum another cog in our works about parliamentary sovereignty. But anyway, in the Shields case, Denning recognised the binding effect of the European Courts of Justice and the treaty provisions upon the UK, which was shown in McCarthy, where the courts deferred 
to the supremacy not of Parliament but of the European Court of Justice and treaty provisions. The McCarthy case is a case that came one year later, McCarthy and Smith, another UK case, another British case, another English and Welsh case, which, as we said, followed on from what Lord Denning was saying. And ECJ earlier decided in this matter the provisions were directly effective. So we even have the European Court of Justice in the case of Den Di Ferni versus Sabina, 1976. So right about the time that Lord Denning made his previous case where he was saying, oh yeah, Parliament's supreme. The European Courts turned around and said, Parliament is not supreme. So Denning's like, ooh, probably make up for that. Anyway, now we start to jump to the cases of Pickstone and the case of Duke. So Pickstone and Freeman PLC 1989 and Duke and Re- and the case of Duke and Reliance Systems Limited 1988. So in the case of Pickstone, the justices referred the case referred to the previous case of Duke that provide that the courts could change an act of parliament to enable its compliance with the EU directive. So now we're not even just saying European law is supreme, we are saying the courts will favour EU law over parliament law, and if parliament law is the problem, quite in opposite to the earlier case of Felix Stowe, the courts will enforce European law over Parliament Acts and not the other way around. Now, Lord Keith accepted community law over a narrow interpretation of Parliament Act. So he was saying, so they even started to grow a little, the judiciary, saying, well, we can make a decision that narrowly, you know, defines this Parliament Act, which might lead to injustice in the case. Or we could take a broad interpretation of community law, which is really what community law is all about, and find a just decision. And Lord Keefe went with the community law. Now, this same view is repeated again in the cases of Garland. Uh, Garland and British Railway Engineering. This is an earlier case in 1983. So not quite the same authority, but even there it was done. And in the case of Lister and Fourth Dry Dock, 1990. So a, a little later case in Pickstone, a year on. In both of those cases, the justices construed Pickstone, apart from Garland. Garland went its own way. So in a way, Pickstone followed Garland. But where the justices construed Pickstone to give courts greater power to supply implication words into Parliament Acts to make them comply with EU treaties. That's Lister. Lister basically was talking about the cases of Garland and compared it to Pickstone and then said, oh, well, we can use certain words to make Parliament Acts compatible. Then we've got the cases of Factortain, came around in the 90s. Again, this is a common law principle that established a large extent parliamentary supremacy Courts cannot bring injunctions against the ground. So, Factortain went backwards, in a way, after this sweep, you can almost say, of parliamentary sovereignty being knocked down again and again and again. The courts sort of went reactionary and decided, oh damn, they might get upset if we uh, keep knocking down parliamentary acts. So we need to save right now, that's not what we're doing. And we cannot go against the crown. But, in fact, attain, that was changed. So, there was an act called the Crown Proceedings Act 1947, which basically said the court cannot rule against uh, Parliament. However, as we know, in the last 10 years or so, that's exactly what the courts were doing. They were just saying they were getting it from the European Union, so they're not to blame. The European Union is to blame. Even so, Factortain was more or less a case that you could say cleared up the waters and any uncertainties. Like if anyone decided to go back and say, oh yeah, I swear you can't have done 10 years worth of lawmaking because that would be illegal. That's the courts basically proving that they can override parliamentary sovereignty in case law. 
by saying, nah, no, nah, we, we didn't do anything illegal. Um, perfectly within our rights. That's that's a retrospective case. That is really law. If anyone wants to point to a case that is so strongly a situation of the common law overriding parliament, not just present but past, it might be factor tape over just that. Anyway, so Lordsbridge states the supremacy of community laws in this regard was a well-established principle long before the UK joined the ECC. And we know that to be the case because we've spoken about those early cases, uh, you know, like Flamenco Costa, which basically made it clear. I'm sorry, parliamentary sovereignty, not a thing. So we move on to some more cases. So we, again, Factortain talks about We've got the Equal Opportunities Act, sorry about that, which came from the case of R and Secretary of State for Employment, Ex Parte, Equal Opportunities Commission, 1995. Now, in that case, they talked about how a non-operative um, was indirectly discriminated against in terms of equal pay. And that the national courts did have the power to make a decision. And then we had political commentators like and the Times newspaper at the time reporting that the House of Lords might have just gained the position of a constitutional court. This was, you could even, that's basically, this is derived from the Council Directive, the Equal Pay Directive, 19. 76 and the case of Bikal Kofhaf GmbH Weber von Hartz 1987 as well as an article by Patricia Maxwell the House of Lords as a Constitutional Court the implications of ex parte EOC uh, 19 as well as the House of Lords its parliamentary judicial roles 1999 in these legal writings, uh, they pointed to the fact that the UK now as a constitutional court, but really that idea is a bit dated. It's, it's sort of, we've just caught clogged on to the fact that the courts are actually doing something that they've been doing for decades. I feel is very, really quite strange, but they do draw parallels between that case anyway, the equal rights case, or at least factor tain, and the Madison case. Because if you think about it, the Madison case, known as Marbury versus Madison, Madison was, I believe, president, one of the later presidents of America. He wasn't one of the... He was a, Thomas Madison, I think. There's a lot of Toms over there. One of the sort of founding fathers, maybe the fourth, fifth, or seventh president. I'm really not good at my American history. Anyway, there was this case where the Supreme Court basically wrote its own powers into the Constitution. It said, you know, if this Constitution is to be enforced, you need a judiciary to enforce it. You don't seem to have written a lot about the judiciary, so don't worry. We'll write our own powers in. And what this is saying is that that same case of equal pay was in effect the British court saying you know what there's a lot of EU case common law and case law and statute that says our courts have power and unfortunately the parliament doesn't appear to have caught up with the concept so I tell you what we'll do you a favour government and We'll write our own powers in because, you know, we don't want you to make a mistake on this factor. And that's what the UK court uh, newspapers are saying. They're saying it appears that the UK House of Lords have given themselves more power than was believed they had before. Well, Wade's still around at this time, still making discussions, and he also construes the words of Lord Bridge as meaning that the 1972 European Community Act had bound successive parliaments. And Craig, another 
you know, legal writer, he even earlier said that the 1972 Act was a catalyst for eroding Dicey's theory of parliamentary sovereignty. So, yeah, not quite the same. So, we have fact attain at that time, you know, the government only had 34% of the vote. So, government wasn't exactly the most legitimate source of power in Britain. And in fact, the courts were in a very strong position to say we can protect the Constitution because they would say, what right does a parliament of 34%, so we're not talking anywhere near a majority of the population support this government, what right do they have to say this is the law of the land? The courts very rightly said, you know what, there were decisions made by the population in the referendum that had over 50% vote, that had the popular vote. So anything that comes out of that European Parliament, we can enforce. What they're basically saying is almost like an entrenched constitution. It's saying the only times when the courts should follow Parliament, if there is a disagreement between European Union and Parliament, is if the Parliament of the day has a really quite large following. So over 50 or 60 percent. If the Parliament is really the majority of people support this government, then maybe the courts should give lenience to it. Or even think of that, how that could be also construed. In the referendum vote, you saw a majority of people voting in favour of Brexit. Now, what the courts are basically saying here, what Wade is saying, is that it doesn't matter if Parliament has like 20% of the votes, doesn't matter if there's a really strong case for Remain. It doesn't matter if the judges themselves think that the Constitution supports staying in the European Union. The fact that a majority of people voted in favour of leaving suggests that the courts need to follow that decision because that's the new style of sovereignty. It's very Because they're saying that decision is a legitimate political decision. And that comes down, interestingly, to Lord Coke's idea of fundamental common laws of constitution protected. That you can distinguish cases on whether they were ordinary or, like the European Communities Act, constitutional. Lord Coke, keep in mind, he wasn't against the idea of constitutional law. He was saying there were constitutional cases and there were constitutional acts and they should be treated separately and that Parliament could not simply annul a court decision by normal means. Now there's a case called uh, Burma Oil, so this is Burma Oil and Lord Advocate 1964, so a much earlier case than this whole discussion that's going on. And in that case, they also address this issue of parliamentary sovereignty, and they say Parliament cannot go out of its way and override constitutional law. Very interesting, very interesting. So, with all this massive legal debate raging over the centuries and really into the decades, we arrive at the Jackson case of 2005. Right? So you've heard a lot over the time. We've got Lord Coke saying they are fundamental rights, Parliament is not fully sovereign, but at the time, we can say they are sovereign because nothing can challenge them. We've got Montesquieu saying... There is a separation of powers. Parliament is not sovereign. There are three branches to the system, the legislative, executive, and all that. So that's no longer the case. Then we have Lord Blackstone writing at a time of war, saying we all got a ban behind Parliament. Parliament is sovereign. Then we have the arrival of Lord Dicey at a time when, again, a time of recent victory over war and great deal of prosperity. And he's saying the exact same words. You know what? Parliament is sovereign and he's selectively using history to support him on this factor however when we start to step into the modern century the european union they've they've really changed that they've britain has changed that referendums have changed that the number of constitutional cases and acts have changed that i mean lord coke the institutes is not an act of parliament it's not a case it's just the statements of a lord and yet when we refer to the definition of murder 
within the common law grounds. We do not talk about any specific case. We do not talk about any specific act. We talk about how it is put in the article, the book, Institutes by Lord Coke, because that is the leading authority. This which is not a parliamentary act. And the same, Lord Blackstone's writing, the commentaries, what we often use as a strong support in understanding early law and some modern law, which is really strange in itself, that's not written by, that's not a parliamentary act, that's not case, that is literally a book. No, it is technically a secondary seat, secondary resource. It is not primary source, same as the institutes, that is not a primary source, yet it has become a primary source because of how it has been treated by later cases and laws and what the rest of it. And what we're getting to here is Parliament's not actually that supreme. Parliament's never been that supreme. Dice sees time, you could make an argument to say it was supreme, but even Dice, he says, supremacy can be surrendered if Parliament chooses to. And that's what the ECC was. It was Parliament's supreme. You know, surrendering power. And that is what, going back, way back to our early statement now, um, about sovereignty of Parliament, Lord Hope was saying. Lord Hope said, if it was ever absolute, now we said, you know, big area of complaints here, probably it was never absolute. But even if it was, it now has to be qualified by European law. So Dicey's idea has been pretty much fully eroded. Now, in practice, we can say Dicey's idea is fully eroded. In principle, it still exists, because everyone who's everyone uh, still goes around saying Parliament is supreme. Hell, Parliament is still saying it's supreme. Now that we've got the Brexit decision, Parliament's saying, oh, yeah, we can, we're just going to do the Great Reformation Acts and do whatever but keep in mind can parliament do whatever could could for example theresa may go ahead and make an act that in this is again this has to be in practice could she go ahead and make an act that forbid um employment rights just got rid of all employment rights now in theory yes in reality she has a minority government so, no. If she tried, which she did try, remember that tax that's only recently, this is 2017, there was a discussion that led up to the referendum, and she said, yeah, we're going to cut a lot of the, um, inher not the inheritance, we're going to cut some of the support that exists to the elderly. Now, that would have been an act, that's an unpopular act, and lo and behold, the government had to retreat on that one as well, as many other cases like the uh, reintroducing grammar schools, they had to retreat on that. So if Parliament is sovereign, it should be able to make any decision it wants. It can't. But then again, we're talking about the executive. So maybe if we say Parliament sovereignty in terms of the legislative, if the legislative branch made a decision, it's supreme. Well, again, not so much the case. Do you remember there was a case, in fact, it might be this Jackson case, but there was a case to do with... Uh, measurements, imperial measurements, or there was another case where Parliament decided, oh, I've got to find the case, I'm sorry that I don't have it with me, I, I'm just remembering it off the top of my head, I might have in fact referenced it, I'm not even realised, I'm sorry about that if that's the case, but there was a case where the Parliament had made a decision, and the courts just went, well, we think this goes against European law, according to earlier precedent we have to generally speaking follow parliament acts however because we don't think this is in keeping with european law what we're going to do instead we're just not going to use it we're just not going to follow it which is really interesting because if parliament is supreme then the courts should follow it they shouldn't be able to just say well we don't agree with it so we're not going to do anything we're, we're just not going to enforce it in the law if anyone breaks the law then They've broken the law, but that's got nothing to do with us. We're just not going to 
get them for it. I think it was to do with imperial measurements. Basically, there had been a recent act passed that talked about things to be measured in pounds. I'm certain it was something like that. 1978, uh, 1990, something. But any, anyway, there was some law that basically said everything has to be measured in pounds and stone. And the farmer in question was saying, could I rely on that case to override the European Communities Act? Because this is an act of parliament, which says we have to use that. And the European Communities Act says we have to use everything European. The Europeans say you have to use the metric system. So because of parliament actually saying you can't follow a metric system, that should, you know, topple one domino, the whole thing falls apart. The courts just said, yeah, we realise that that's probably not what parliament was intending. They probably didn't want us to end the European Communities Act on such a small decision. So what we're going to do is just not follow that law and say it never happened. Which is interesting. Anyway, we're also going to look at, at the time when Jackson made the Jackson case came about, the real rise in the human rights. Which Lord Coke, remember Lord Coke saying there are some rights which no government, no parliament can be supreme over. Those fundamental rights. Well, the Human Rights Charter and the Human Rights Act solidifies that. The Scotland Act 1998 solidifies that. This is a new legal order. That's something that we get from Lord Stern in the case of... Let me just grab the case. It's the same, same case, actually, in the Jackson, Jackson case. In the Jackson case, Lord Stern talks about the idea that we exist in a new legal order and that Parliament is not sovereign, that sovereignty was divided, that we no longer have an uncontrolled constitution, that we have a constrained constitution, and that the words absolute, uncontrolled, has lost that qualification over time. And he referenced uh, Section 2 of the European Community Act 1972, which basically conceded the doctrine of supremacy, which said that community law is now supreme over Parliament. So... I've talked about an absolute mammoth load of law here, case law, acts, uh, extrajudicial statements. But we've got to the end point that the idea of parliamentary sovereignty exists as a political and diplomatic caveat. You know, that, however, it's not a constitutional statement. But we've got to move on from Jackson, because Jackson... When even when you know Lord Pope makes that statement, that's in two thousand and five. A lot has happened in the last twelve years. You know, at the point of Jackson, it's we can very rightly say Parliament is no longer sovereign. And the Devolution Acts of ninety eight prove this. The surrendering of parliamentary sovereignty to Northern Ireland during the Goodwill Agreement, Good Friday Agreement. Supports this. The Scotland Acts of 2012. Remember the Scottish referendum that led to that? You know, that came on after that? We can't go back. The Regional Government Acts of 2004. The devolved powers of that, that gave. The House of Lords Act 1999 that removed hereditary peers. The Freedom of Information Act 2000 that placed an obligation on Parliament to be transparent on data. The Data Protection Act 1998, the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 that created the Supreme Court, the Tribunal Courts, the Tribunal Courts and Enforcement Act that create 2007 that created the Tribunals, the Parliamentary Standards Act 2010, the Localisms Act 2011, the Parliamentary Voting System and Constituencies Act 2011, the Cabinet Manual and its revisions, the Fixed Term Parliament Act 2011, the Scottish Road referendum 2015 and even the brexit referendum 2016 whoa all that came after jackson and with every single one it's like a nail in the coffin for our par concept of parliamentary sovereignty because in practice how strong can a parliament be to undo that now i i can say this is where we're going to make a difference. Dicey says that no past parliament, no future parliament can be constrained by past parliament. But as we all fell well know, cases like Factor Team basically said, if your government doesn't have a lot of support, if your parliament isn't 
a parliament the majority is it in voted in by the majority you don't have absolute power which means you can have future parliaments constrained by the past and these cases that seceded supremacy to others sovereignty to others remove the absolute powers of Westminster Parliament if you are really determined to make our parliamentary sovereignty still exist, you might just say, oh, well, all these acts have been passed by Parliament. So, um, like Lord Kilmer was saying, you can just undo everything and Parliament is supreme again. But would you? Would you really? Would You would have to wait until you had, say, Northern Ireland unites. They have one government again. You know, like, there's no disputes in the middle between Sinn Féin and the DUP. They just have one really strong majority government. And that government is, let's say, the Conservative Party, right? And at the same time, Scotland is run by the Conservative Party. And England is run by the Conservative Party. And Wales is majority run by the Conservative Party. And in all these jurisdictions, they have popular support. Then, such a government could full well, within reason undo a lot of the devolution acts because they would say we have the support of the majority of people including the people in the areas who would be most affected and because we have that support uh they in effect are agreeing to the decision we're making but nowadays when we have the scottish nationalist party in scotland you try and pull that stunt they will pull another referendum so in effect we can't take back powers already given unless parliament reaches a stage where it is really super legitimate so in effect we have created our own entrenched constitution anyway this all has proved to undermine the concept of parliamentary sovereignty and as lord denning commented in the case of blackburn when he considered the statue of westminster 1931 freedom once given cannot be taken away and despite the ordinary legal theory that Parliament being sovereign cannot abandon its sovereignty, and that comes from the um, Foburn and Sunderland City Council Act uh, case 2002, we can rightly say constitutional laws should be seen as the exception to the rule of sovereignty. So perhaps the Foburn case should have considered a separation of the law. So... Parliament is sovereign in the places where it's sovereign. Parliament is not sovereign in the places where it's not sovereign. So let's just say there's a dualist system where Parliament is in charge and then everyone else controls the other areas, right? So that's how you could understand it. Anyway, let's get to the most, the big case nowadays that is, well, it's been cited now. But that was contemplating exactly this issue of Jackson's parliamentary sovereignty. And that was the Miller's case 2017. Now, why can we say this was debating parliamentary sovereignty? Well, if we go ahead and say the referendum was a piece of advice, like some are commenting. They're saying it's just advice. It's not legally binding. I, I personally think such a statement, again is not coming from it's coming from a personal bias i'm not sure if the legal authority exists for that statement maybe what they're relying on is the fact that in the wording of the act itself it basically treats it as advice but the fact it is an act suggests it is binding on parliament because it is a parliament act and thus a referendum is a legitimate act and the government of David Cameron, who introduced it, uh, the coalition government, I believe would have more authority than Theresa May. And the government that was re-elected in before the referendum was a more of a majority government than what we have today. So what you can basically say is the referendum had more authority, really, than Parliament at the time and even now. Anyway... Um, yeah, some constitutional laws are the exception to sovereignty. And you can get that from the case of R, uh, brackets, HS2 Action Alliance, 
and Secretary of State for Transport 2014. So a later case, later than Jackson, later than Foburn, but really turns around this whole idea. 12 years on, and it says, well, constitutional laws aren't the same as normal laws. So anyway, what the Brexit case of Miller, uh, Miller... Oh, God, have I not? Yeah, I wrote it down here. So, R on the application of Miller and Dos Santos and the Secretary of State for Exiting European Union Supreme Court Judgment 19, uh, 2017. Why am I saying 19? 2017. So, Lord Denning said, if ever there was a time of Brexit, it would be the courts that decide if it is legally suitable. What Miller is doing is entrenching this concept so if we're saying the european union is no longer sovereign we would have to say parliament is sovereign however if making that decision itself is something which is not even decided by parliament but by the courts can we still claim Parliament to be absolutely sovereign, like Dicey? Probably not. Anyway, so the courts discussed in that one the Lisbon Treaty of 2007, uh, the Declaration Number 17, the formulation of Article 50, and, you know, the idea of the Great Repeal Bills of 2017 to 2019, and probably in the years to come after that, as well as the devolution, because... Remember, I think Ireland, Scotland and Wales all waded in on this. Uh, they became part of the case. And they were able to put forward their own arguments for Remain and Lee. The constitutional impact was discussed with great importance. And there was the idea of undermining the Sewell Convention. Now, for those who don't know, the Sewell Convention basically says... It's a very old convention, and it's the idea that the British government, the the English and Welsh government, can't go ahead and do something without uh, the full support of, say, the Scottish government, one of the devolved powers, if it affects the devolved powers. Now, what the court said is, no, that's not really the case. The Parliament does have the constitutional power to, if it wished, repeal any devolved powers, even the Statue of Westminster, and anything else for that matter, just like what Blackstone was saying, and this supports the Dicey Inferior Parliamentary Sovereignty. Really, that's a very confusing sort of turn of events, because how can we have the judiciary saying Parliament is supreme? If a branch in its own right is supreme, does it need validation from another branch? In validating it, could you say that it is not supreme? I feel like we're stepping into the land of circular logic here, so a lot to think about. So if you take it with a pinch of salt, we can say historically Parliament was perhaps absolute, but it was not wholly supreme. Over the years, over the centuries, over the decades, the role of supremacy has flown back and forth from other sources to Parliament, depending on the legitimacy, the wealth, so on and so forth, power and all the rest of it. And that with the referendum, and now this is this is an entirely new thing to say here. I believe that the referendums are another form of sovereignty questioning Parliament, because in practical use, political and diplomatic, can you go against a referendum decision? Probably not, because in that moment, Parliament is surrendering its sovereignty. It's saying, look, you elected us to make a decision. We can't make one, so we're letting you decide. You make the decision. Whatever you say will highly influence what we say. Keep in mind, we live in a system where Parliament's are massively impacted by the decisions of the electorate. So, I might say referendums are more sovereign, but a lot, there hasn't been actually a lot of papers written about just this point in time, because there's only been like, there's only been a few referendums in our time. Uh, 
only two major ones, really, the join the European Union and now the leaving European Union. And otherwise, referendums have been very much on the small scale. So the Scottish devolution, that was very much in the Scottish referendum in Scotland, the Welsh ones and the Irish ones. So they weren't really countrywide like they are now. So concluding on this very point, Lord Hope made his statement and he referred to the changing political and legal landscape of Britain. He evidenced that Parliament is no longer sovereign in the absolute sense of dicey. And by the time of Miller and Brexit, we can say this is even more the case. Because while Parliament is no longer bound by the European Union under the European Communities Act, they have become consistent, constitutionally bound by European Union in the European... Uh, sorry, bound by the European Union Withdrawal Act 2017... They have been bound by the European Union Referendum Act of 2015, which has forced them to do that. They have been bound by the fact attain, which basically said that they were no longer absolute, that courts do have their own powers. And as far as I know, Parliament and the court have made no attempts to change that area of the law. Maybe they'll try in future and we will see whether that will be seen as constitutionally valid. But there have been no attempts in that regard. There have been no further attempts to question the continual role of the monarchy. Because in theory, the monarchy could dissolve the government if it was truly really unpopular enough. So even there, they're not sovereign. They can't just go ahead and do whatever they like. We don't live in an age where Britain is an, the absolute power. Now it's America and China. So if Britain, say, tried to legislate in America... Would it be able to? Probably not, because then you'd have alliances fracturing, you'd have other practical consequences. So we've got to get past this area of theory, because really it's not a philosophy. If a philosophy says, oh yeah, in theory they can do that, but in practice they can't, then that theory doesn't have a lot of weight to it, really. Now, Lord Hope, his statement was evaluating the truth of this whole thing, that there was an English principle of Parliament sovereignty. It's Dicey's principle of parliamentary sovereignty. I will re remark upon saying that Blackstone has a very different principle. Coke had a very different principle. Wade had a different principle. Lord Hope has a different principle. A lot of people have different interpretations of parliamentary sovereignty as we know from the monist view the dualist views and just so much so much that's been said even vernon bogner in his statement after the referendum the people not parliament are sovereign that was written in 2016 vernon bogner is a leading professor for public law and he makes the statement in support of my own words that the referendum now shows Parliament is not supreme. So, long way of getting to it. We've covered a lot of different law here. This has been quite a discussion over quite a lot of areas of the law in the past. A lot of case law, a lot of common law, a lot of acts, monstrous amounts of stuff. And ultimately, we've gotten to the situation where we can say parliamentary sovereignty does not exist. I know I say this and it's going to cause a problem because BBC have already made news journal articles there and videos which I referenced at some point in here and I'll have to find it because I looked at them. They're on YouTube. As long as BBC or whoever put them up there doesn't delete them, you'll be able to find them again. But BBC basically questioning a lot of professors about parliamentary sovereignty. And they all said, you know, Parliament is not very sovereign. Now sovereignty is returning to Parliament. But we've looked at the law here together, haven't we? We've seen that historically that's never been the case. Practically, that's never been the case. In modern times, it's still not the case. Parliament really isn't sovereign. And I honestly take real big issues with the continuing support of Dicey's theory of parliamentary sovereignty. This is a personal critique now, because we've covered all of the law in a very 
unbiased and objective manner. As a legal critic, as a critique of law, Dicey needs to stop being enforced in uh, the legal education system. It's, it's just not fact. It's not true authority. It's not correct anymore. We always say, oh, this is parliamentary sovereignty, and then go around and say, oh, but, you know, Dicey's wrong. This is the fact. And act like that's a modern idea. It's never been a modern idea. Dicey, when he said parliament was sovereign, that was a modern concept. That was going against the grain. Because other people had said on the face of it, yeah, it's absolute, and then further had gone on to say, but it's not. And that had been the case throughout the centuries. So, really, we need to start pushing this idea of maybe Lord Coke's parliament sovereignty. Or even forget all this. Let's just talk about modern judges. Let's just say, look... Lord Hope says this, that is the modern view of parliamentary sovereignty. Or Vernon Bogner, he's saying it's this, that it's the people. Let's push that. Or even Andrew Lesoy, he's he didn't really do a large section in his second edition, but in his third edition he says more on Brexit, and he says more about exactly this point. So in our discussion over parliamentary sovereignty, I hope you have learned a lot more than you knew. I do implore you to read into this area because it is really interesting and I'm sad that I only had an hour and a bit to discuss it. I could literally go on for hours. The case law used in this and the common law and the you know legislation is massive, but it could be so much longer. I could probably write a book if I wanted on just this topic or a t at least a dissertation on parliamentary sovereignty. I don't think it would, would be beyond your means. You could have even said that, you know, Dicey's theory was a, a load of bunk from day one. And it's just because he's an Oxford professor who was leading in public law at the time that whatever statement he wanted to make, and Parliament wasn't going to go against him. I mean, if you say Parliament's supreme, they're, they're going to, and they're going into, they've just stepped out of a war, they're probably going to go, yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, everyone, everyone listen to Dicey, he's the right man. I just teach everyone forever that's the case. Well... It's not. And hell, I could have even dropped George Orwell's 1984. I mean, George Orwell talks about the idea that if you start saying something as absolute power, you're giving up your freedom of liberties. And he's, he's talking about how that is. And then when he was passing away, he also said that he believed that Britain was going in that direction as long as it fought like this. But, you know. Other things, other things. Maybe I should have added that to my list, you know, George Orwell's last words and 1984, but... Hey-ho, it's not enough words in the word count. Um, just so you know, this is based off an essay that I myself wrote on parliamentary sovereignty, um, which received a first at the time. Sadly, it wasn't... It's not as well written as I think it could have been. So, there you go. Anyway... You wanted the bibliography, you waited till the end, so I'm going to give you the bibliography, all the sources that I used, so that if you want to go over this area again yourself, uh, you can use them yourself as well. So, first we'll start with the primary sources, this is legislation. So we, I looked at the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, the Constitutional Reform Act 2005, the Crown Proceedings Act 1947, the Data Protection Act 1998, the European Communities Act 1920, 1972, the European Union Referendum Act 2015, the Fixed Term Parliament Act 2011, the Freedom of Information Act 2000, the House of Laws Act 1999, the Human Rights Act 1998, the Localisms Act 2011, the Northern Ireland Act 1998, the Parliament Acts 1911, the Parliament Voting System and Constituency Act 2011, the Parliamentary Act 1949, the Parliamentary Standards Act 2010, the Regional Assemblies Brackets Preparations Close Brackets Act 2003, Scotland Act 1998, Scotland Act 2012, Scottish Independence Referendum Act 2013, the Statute of Westminster 1931, the Tribunal Courts and Enforcement Act 2007, the War Damages Act 1965, probably a few more as well I'm not mentioning there. The cases I looked at were the Application des Gaz Sa S.A. v. Folks Veritas Limited, 1974, the Blackburn and Attorney General, 1971, 
the Burma Oil Co. and Lord Advocate 1964, the Cheney and Con 1968, the Consolidated Version of the Treaty of the European Union 2008. Why? Why is that there? Hold on a minute. Uh oh. Okay. Um, I appear to have given the wrong subtitles, but those those are some EU. Um, directives. Oh gosh. Anyway, so let's just keep going, right? They're, they're all bibliographies. You can put them in your own order. Put them in the correct order. The Council Directive, uh, the Equal Treatment Directive, the Council Directive, the Equal Pay Directive, the Duke and Reliance Systems Limited, 1988. Then we have... See, those should have been the EU Treaty Directive. What the hell happened to my referencing system? Sorry about that. So we also got the Felix Stowe. This is... Some of these are going to be cases. Some of these are EU cases. I'm really sorry for that, but I think these are all UK cases, as far as I can tell, apart from something at the end. So, we've got Felix Stowe, Docks Railway Co. The, and British Transport Docks Board, 1976. The Garland and British Rail Engineering Limited, 1983. The HB Balmer Limited and Bollinger, 1974. The Jackson Turn Turn, 2005. The Lister... Fourth Dry Dock, 1990. The McCarthy and Smith, 1979. The McCrawley and the King, 1920. Pigstone and Freeman, PLC, 1989. RHS, um, open brackets, HS2 Action Lights, close brackets, and Secretary of State for Transport, 2014. R, open brackets, on the application of Miller and Dos Santos, close brackets, and Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, Supreme Court Judgment, 2017. R and Secretary of State for Employment, Ex Parte Equal Opportunities Commission, 1995. R and Secretary of State for Transport, Ex Parte Factor Tame Limited, 1991. Salomon and Customs and Excise Commissioners, 1967. Sheridan Combs, open brackets, holding, close brackets, limited, 1978. Foburn and Sunderland City Council, 2002. Treaty of Lisbon, amending the Treaty of European Union and the Euro Treaty Establishing the European Community Act, 2007. Uh, then we get on to the EU cases. At least these are EU cases. Case 106 slash 77, Administrator de la Finate de la Statos Semenful uh, SPA, 1978. Case 170 slash 84, Bilka Kufhas GmbH, Weber von H and Weber von Hartz. 1987. Case 43-75. Defrini versus Savina. 1976. Case C213-89. R and the Secretary of State for Transport Ex Party Factor Tame Limited. Brackets. Factor Tame 1. Close brackets. 1990. What the heck was that? The case of Flamenco Costa versus Enel. 1964. The case... Of International Handel Gleister Staff MBH N Thur and Voracity Fur Gritande and Fur Matil nineteen seventy. The case of Fur Grand N Luz nineteen sixty three. Then we have our secondary sources, of which I mentioned legal treaties. Remember, I did not believe that Blackstone or the Institutes counts as primary sources. Others may take a different view, but I put them down as legal treaties. Edward Coke Institutes of the Law of England, Volume 3, the 4th, Part 14, 1797. William Blackstone, William Blackstone's Commentaries on the Law of England, 1765 to 1769. That was Book 4. And then we have William Blackstone's Commentaries on the Law of England, Volume 1. Uh, US Cases, Marbury and Madison, 1803. Journals, A.W. Bradley and others, Constitution and Administrative Law. Hmm, that sounds like a book. Ah, oh, why did I get these in the wrong order, I tell you? Um, then Dicey, so this is Dicey's actual work here. The Law of the Constitution, Volume 1. Francis Bacon's History of the Reign of King Henry the Seventh. I think that's Seventh, yeah. Let's this, this, that's Seventh, so it's... Um, V-I-I, so I'm going to say that's Seventh. 1622. Um, John Ferris, The Greatest Power on Earth, Great Britain, 1920s, International History Review. H.R. Uh, Wade, The Great 
The Basis for Legal Sovereignty, 1995. H.R. Wade's Sovereignty of the Sovereignty Revolution or Evolution, 1996. Lord Diplock, The Common Markets and Common Law, 1972. Muck Ilwain, the, the High Courts of Parliament and its Sovereignty, a, an historical essay on the boundaries between legislation and adjudication in England, 1910. Paul Craig, Sovereignty of the United Kingdom Parliament after Fact Same, 1991. P.B. Keenan, Some Legal Consequences of Britain's Entry into the European Common Market, 1962. R. Edwards, Bonham Case, The Ghost in Constitutional Machine, Denning's Law Journal, 1996. Here we go, books. De Montesquieu, The Spirit of the Laws. Francis Bacon, The Argument in the Case of De Reggae Constitution, 1616. Ian Loveland, Ian Loveland's Constitutional Law, Administrative Law and Human Rights, A Critical Introduction, 2012. Jay Grace, Constitutional Administrative Law, 2015. Geoffrey Goldsworth, Myth of the Common Law <laughs> Constitution, 2007. S Joffrey Goldsworth, The Sovereignty of Parliament, History and Philosophy, 1999. Andrew Lesueur, uh, Morris Sunkin, and Jay Merkins, Public Law, Text, Cases and Materials, 2013. Please look at the 2017 version. M. Ryan and S. Foster, Unlocking Constitutional Administrative Law, 2014. Patricia Maxwell, The House of Laws as a Constitutional Court, The Implications of Ex Parte, EOC as well as the House of Lords, its Parliamentary and Judicial Roles, 1999. T.R. Allen, Law, Liberty and Justice, The Legal Foundations of British Constitutionalism, 1993. Here are the Parliamentary Guidance Notes we looked at. Cabinet Manual, 2011, the Devolution Guidance Note, 10. Here are some case reviews we looked at. Uh, Edward Coke, Dr. Bonham Case, 1610. This was taken out of Coke's The Reports of Sir Edward Coke on divers resolutions then we have we also looked at the hansard we looked at the 1856 hansard we looked at the house of lords hansard 1967 we looked at sir j sir g ribbon um his volume 831 released 1972 which remarked which is stored in Hansard 1803 to 2005. Very strange. Uh, the committee reports we looked at House of Commons, the EU Bill and Parliamentary Sovereignty European Scrutiny Committee 2011. The Public Records Office we looked at, Public Records Office uh, FO 371 slash 150369. We looked at US politicians' correspondence. That would be the Thomas Jefferson in the writings of Thomas Jefferson, being his autobiography, correspondence reports, messages, addresses, and other writings, official and private. 1853 to 1854. We looked at the newspapers, the Times uh, 1994 article, Britain may now, for the first time in its history, um, a constitution court. May now, yeah. And Vernon Bogner's After the Referendum, The People, Not Parliament, Are Sovereign. That was printed in the Financial Times. So there you go. Absolutely massive list there that you can look at. I, Looking at it, I feel there's even some that I forgot to bring over from my references, our scholar references to the bibliography, and I'm sorry for that. But we have been here for an awful long time, and there you have my first discussion of the day, which is on parliamentary sovereignty. And this is a public law question. Now, I'm just another student of law, uh, Cameron Hayden, I do hope you appreciate the discussion. I hope to one day become a barrister, so this is important. I hope it helps you as you are writing about this subject, interested in this subject, want to know about this subject, and this is a massive discussion here that we've had together. I really hope it does you the world of good to know about it. And that you listen in to our next radio how oh, this is web and web radio isn't it our next podcast my intentions are to go through just about every area of the law and the niche areas of the law and discuss them and maybe go into 
certain tangents we find interesting. Like right here, this is administrative law. We've just gone down the parliamentary sovereignty route. So hopefully there'll be more discussion. Thank you for being here with me today. Hopefully we'll be there together next time. So until then, I'll see you again.